Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone from all over the world. Uh, I'm Sharon Schaut, and I'm going to Santa Clara University, uh, currently in Arizona State University. Anyway, not, it's not about me. So today, uh, this is our second keynote in EDM conference. So allow me to introduce our speaker today. Dr. DiMillo is an associate professor in the Institute of Cognitive Science in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. He has co-edited seven books and published more than 300 journal papers, book chapters, conference proceedings. His research has received 16 awards and counting at the international conference level and has been funded by numerous grants. Uh, Dr. DiMillo De serves as associate editor on the edit editorial boards of 11 journals. He leads the NSF funded multi-million national institute for student agent teaming. That uh, specific institute, I'm sure, uh, hopefully he will share uh, more insight with us later. So, okay, to let me give you a little bit backstory. You know, just between Sherry and me, we actually fight, you know, for the right to introduce uh, Professor DeMillo because he's uh, easy to introduce, but also very challenging to introduce. Easy in a way because he produced um, it, it, the list of his achievement. I really goes on and on. We could just read it out and it, it's very exciting but it's very challenging to introduce him because he produces so much high quality and exciting work across discipline. So in a way, you know, this is kind of hard to uh, introduce him. So I remember last time I actually heard his keynote uh, in LAC 17 in Vancouver, and that was a huge success. Uh, the topic is about uh, multi-model classroom analytics, and that was such a success. Since then, it's been five years and he has moved from Notre Dame to Colorado. So we are very thrilled and privileged to have him today to share with us his journey, his insights and interesting work. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Dr. Sydney DeMillo to talk about from modeling individuals to groups. It's multi-model, multi-party. The floor is yours. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Sherry and uh, Sharon, for introducing me. And uh, that was a great introduction. Uh, it's, it's an honor. Uh, and for um, you know uh, running the organizing the program for this exciting conference. Um, I was the program chair myself in 2013, and, and it it really is a terrific amount of work. So it's much appreciated, especially doing this uh, through Zoom. Um, so great to be here, folks. Uh, and you know, uh, my first EDM conference. Just thinking back, um, we we submitted our first paper uh, was in 2010, um, and then uh, it's been really fun being part of the community um, over the, the many years. And and the last conference was in Montreal that I attended, and that was that was a great time. Um, so hope, hope, hoping to get back uh, into the cycle uh, once again next year. Um, okay, so. Um, the, the, the title of my talk is uh, For Modeling Individuals to Groups. It's a multimodal, uh, multi-party, just a little play of words there. Um, and uh, I wanna just start by thinking, uh, by just telling you a little bit about uh, our work um, uh, over the last few years. Uh, and so we've been thinking a little bit more about education from the perspective of education itself towards developing, to developing the workforce. So when we think about EHR, you know, education and human resources, or uh, EWD, education and workforce development. So lately, we've been thinking a lot more about this transition from schooling uh, to the work. And uh, there's many perspectives on the future of work, but one that is that is most would agree is that one future of work is really collaborative teams of humans and presumably AI solving non-routine analytic problems. Think about the problems facing us today, uh, the, the global pandemic. Now you have a vaccine, how do you roll out a vaccine? Uh, where I live, we are always under threat of fires. How do you put out complex fires? So all of these complex challenges really require teams of individuals to come together 
to solve new problems. Yes, they're familiar, but every fire is different and every pandemic is different, right? And previously, in addition to just human teams, now you increasingly have AI in the mix. So this is a rather dated graph uh, on looking, uh, looking at the future kind of jobs and with automation, but not just regular automation with AI actually automating some cognitive tasks. Uh, it is increasingly thought that the future is a lot more about these non-routine interpersonal, non-routine analytic and interpersonal tasks. So how do we prepare our students for this future? And then we've, people have thought about this and then people are thinking about how can AI enable education, which is the core of, you know, um, what we do here in EDM, help students prepare for this workforce. And there's many models of 21st century skills. And of course, we've traditionally focused on these foundational literacies, uh, literacy, numeracy, scientific literacy. We've added to this information technology, financial literacy, and also understanding culture and civics. Um, but then we think about these, uh, these 21st century competencies, critical thinking and problem solving, creativity, communication, collaboration, these are just a few. But then there's also this importance of building character. Um, as, we, as, we, as we focused on the future, how do we develop our students to be curious, have gratitude, uh, take initiative and so on and so forth. So the thinking of education as being more of this holistic approach that develops these multiple competencies. So a few years back, um, uh, Ken was invited to uh, write this paper and he uh, very graciously um, uh, offered me uh, a co-authorship to work together on this. And we, we thought of this is 2013 for a cognitive science audience. How do we teach, tell cognitive science folks about EDM? And um, uh, we had a few great uh, co-authors and we, and, and we worked in this, this diagram that kind of listed at the time, this is almost 10 years ago now, you know, some of the psychological constructs of EDM where we've made a lot of progress. Uh, you can see that on the, on the left, on the bottom row from cognitive skills all the way to social emotional. And then the different types of data we've focused on from clickstream, you know, the bread and butter all the way to discourse. And here are a few, a non-exclusive look at a few like key, uh, you know, key, key technologies. So you can clearly see the cognitive modeling work there. So knowledge tracing and so on. Uh, Ryan's work in gaming the system. But one thing, if you take a closer look at this landscape, um, you might notice, and again, this is back then, is that almost everything is focused on what I would call one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction. So it's a student and a computer, or a student and another student, or a student and a tutor, but it's one-on-one, -on -one, and a very domain-specific pedagogy. We're working on developing algebra, or we're working on developing computer literacy, and so on and so forth. And again, I'm speaking in broad generalities here. And, and, and one piece of work that stands out is work by Carolyn Rose and her team and colleagues in the computer supported collaborative learning world that is focused a lot on collaboration. So in reflecting uh, and, and thinking about the future of the work, workforce that I initially spoke about, I, I wanna just point out in my view, some three opportunities for innovation here. One is enhancing the bandwidth of communication. So going from unimodal one-on-one uh, -on -one towards this and, 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 and you know, human computer clickstream interaction, of course, that is still a very relevant uh, way of interacting and it's not gonna go anywhere and neither should it. But thinking about the future as enhancing the bandwidth of communication towards these multimodal, multi-party naturalistic social interactions. So I'll unpack that a little bit. When teams of people are coming together to solve complex problems and learn uh, and developing both the, the skills to solve these problems as well as actually developing content knowledge and other factors. The second thought is developing the whole student using education as an opportunity to develop along with the foundational knowledge and practice developing 21st century skills and character. So if I'm teaching, some, if, if, if it's an education program on math, should it just be reduced to learning algebra and how to, you know, uh, factor equations or, you know, how, how, to, how to do factors? At the same time, can we help students be better collaborators and actually develop different skills like such as persistence and, and so on? And the last thing is, um, you know, we've had, a, we've had an easy pass with ethics and AI and data for a long time uh, where it's, it's really been, uh, people have not known much about AI and its proliferation. But right now, this is in the, the, the mainstream conversation, right? What is it that AI should do rather than what it can do? And we need to really reimagine ethical and equitable AI in education. And I'll touch on this a little bit. Um, and this is not necessarily 
uh, I look at, I want to frame this as an opportunity. It, it allows us to be in up front of the conversation and rethink how is EDM portrayed. For a lot of people, data mining is actually a really negative term. Uh, and people are afraid of data mining. So how do we how do we get in front of this conversation? And we'll give you some, I'll share some ideas on how we're thinking about doing that. So these are kind of the three big ideas. Um, and I'm mostly gonna talk about the first two today and some plans for number three, because we're just getting started seriously reimagining uh, this. So today I wanna just uh, divide this talk into roughly, I would say three, 10 to 15 minute pieces. Um, first is tell you our work on modeling and facilitating remote collaborative problem solving. So, and this has been particularly relevant in the last year with everything moving remotely. So how can we model what's going on and help facilitate it? The second is uh, taking a little bit of a different look and looking at trying to understand, this is more of a cognitive science, psychological look. What is actually happening when people are interacting? So really understanding interpersonal interactions over space and time. And lastly, um, as uh, you know, as Sharon mentioned, um, I'm very delighted and, and, and honored to lead this new NSF National Institute for Student AI Teaming. And I'd maybe share with you um, how we are tackling those three uh, challenges that I mentioned, uh, the three opportunities and challenges that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so there's a lot of, uh, so let me just get to the first part. Uh, there's been a, a lot of work here uh, and I, I have to um, thank a, a large number of students, uh, colleagues, collaborators, just a few of them listed here. Uh, we started this work maybe back in 2015 uh, or maybe even earlier. Um, and uh, there's been a wave of teams all the way from Notre Dame and now, you know, at CU Boulder. Um, so, um, uh, and just, and so let me just say why are we focusing on collaborative problem solving? Well, um, collaborative problem solving is, first of all, really exciting to study, but it really blends this idea of non-routine problems because you have a problem when you don't know how to get to a, you, you have an end state and you have, a, you have an initial state and you need a path to get to the initial state to the end state. That's a problem. In a collaborative problem solving, the solution is non-trivial. It's non-routine. We don't know how to get there. Um, and second, it's interpersonal. You do it together. Uh, so this is why we think of it as a really nice model to investigate uh, these 21st century skills. Um, it's not just us. Um, the PISA is the program of, you know, the program that evaluates these multiple countries. In 2015, uh, collaborative problem solving was actually one of their focal uh, domains. Uh, and these are how the countries kind of stuck, uh, you know, kind of did. And for once, you know, the US actually did pretty decently um, after you control for performance in reading, math, and science. So it is, it is an internationally recognized, important um, kind of activity and skill uh, to master. And one thing I want to point out is um, what, what I'm going to talk about today is not only about improving collaborative problem solving, but it's also improving the assessment. So, so there's a lot of uh, implications here for how do you assess this skill. So one thing uh, to note, it, you may, it, it may be, people may think that if you get more people, you're going to get a better result. And that's not actually always the case. And this has been known for, for about 100 years, known as the, you know, kind of the Ringelman effect. So in a lot of tasks requiring people to work together, such as these examples before pulling a rope, rowing a boat, and so on, um, what you find is that actually, if you, if you take an individual and you measure the output, and then you say, okay, if one individual can you know, do this task in X amount of time, well, 10 individuals should do it in a 10th of that time, right? So that should be this linear curve up there, potential productivity. But what you notice is that actually, you never really get there. And there's this huge gap between what groups actually achieve and what they could potentially achieve. And this is sometimes called this equation. The actual productivity is potential productivity minus what is lost due to this thing called process loss. And that actually has two components. And there's been some clever experimental designs using what's called pseudo groups when people think they're in a group, but they're not actually in a group. And you find that there's two pieces of this loss. One is this motivation loss, and we've all heard about social loafing. And you know that every time you talk to any kid about group work or even college students, they're gonna tell you, well, I did all the work, these two people did nothing, or so on and so forth, right? So this is, that's called the social loafing effect and so on. And then there's this actually other piece called coordination loss. It is actually more difficult to get people together. So understanding these two factors is really critical to improving these outcomes and making people better collaborators. So our kind of long-term long approach, our basic approach on how we've been looking at this 
is thinking about people interacting remotely at the time. And the reason we focused on remote initially is um, just to simplify the problem. And also because we looked at remote collaboration as being very, very relevant. And, and boy, were we right, given what happened last year and the fact that we're all interacting remotely right now. Um, but uh, the general idea is we have triads and we've also been wanting to focus on triads, groups of three, because you just get these very interesting dynamics because you have an individual you have, an, you have the dyads interacting, and then you actually have all three interacting. And many times, if you have an artifact, like an education, like, a, like if you're working with, with the world, you now have this fourth dimension. So it's very interesting interactions, but also very complex. And so, uh, you know, we mess around with manipulating different fac factors of the group, um, or not even manipulating, actually just studying them as moderators, like what happens if the group is, how diverse is the group and so on. And we've, we've published in that. I won't talk much about that today. And messing around with the actual task, if you increase stress and pressure and all those things. I won't even say much about that today. What I want to talk about today is, um, when you is really looking at trying to make sense of these interactions. Um, and we've been looking at multiple sensors to do that. That's where the multimodality comes in. And this is not just to do it. It's because these sensors actually pick up interesting socio-cognitive affective different aspects of collaboration. So for example, joint attention is really critical when two team members are, are looking at the same reference, for example, then there's turn-taking dynamics. So these different sensors are actually capturing different aspects of this collaboration. But you're not really making a lot of sense from these low level sensing and these, these, these intermediate level patterns. You really need to understand what is going on in collaboration. And for that, we look at actually these models of collaborative problem solving, and these are these higher level patterns that occur. And the question is, can you model these higher level things, which is what we care about from these lower level sensing, that's like part one of the talk, and can you use that to improve these outcome measures? And that's like also part one of the talk, but a second part that I'm really interested in is how do you take this, what is going on at this level of these, what is happening when people are interacting and how can, what can we learn about the cognitive science of collaboration? Um, and so this is kind of the uh, bigger picture. So let me first start by talking to you about a model of collaborative problem solving. So there's, there's a few out there. Um, this is ours. It, we're working actually right now on an alignment with the other models. Um, but ours is intended to be this domain general model and it's still under development. This is done with our work with Val Shute at uh, FSU uh, and most importantly, her uh, student Chen Sun, who by the way is I think on the market right now for a postdoc uh, and she's terrific. Uh, so uh, we look at collaborative problem solving in our model as having these three components, what we call facets, constructing shared knowledge, negotiation and maintaining the team dynamics. So you can think about this as being a lot of cognitive stuff this is being a lot of social stuff and this being this kind of interactive social cognitive piece. And these have sub facets, but most importantly, they have these indicators. And these indicators are um, specific actions people take that you can observe and reliably code. And that's important. So we're grounding everything in actual behavior, mostly verbal ear, but it could also be nonverbal. So this model is like a foundation of what we're gonna be talking about a lot today. So it's important to realize, remember we have three components, construction of shared knowledge, negotiation, coordination, and keeping the team together. And there's other small pieces here that are less relevant. So a couple of findings, uh, we can reliably code these indicators. Um, importantly, these facets are independent of personality, prior knowledge, and verbosity. That's really important. We wanna capture something that goes beyond these other known factors because just speaking a lot more is usually correlates with better performance. And these facets and some of these indicators actually predict CPS performance. And we're, we're still sorting out exactly what's going on there. So um, the first thing we try to do is to see if we could model these things from speech. So this is the first data set um, collected by um, my former grad student, Angela Stewart, who is actually now doing a postdoc at CMU uh, with Amy Ogan. Uh, here's, uh, so here's, I'm going to show you a video. So this is uh, three people uh, interacting in this Minecraft environment. And just to give you a little context, they can use these visual code blocks to like build this, the, to solve this challenge problem. They're giving 20 minutes to solve a very challenging problem. You have to build this brick building with all these constraints and they can run the simulation here. And that's all, and they're left alone. And these are novice computer programmers. They've known nothing about programming before. They've just done about a 20 minute tutorial. So I have a few examples here and um, can you like, uh, there's, there's audio. So can somebody give me a, a thumbs up if you can uh, hear the audio? And then also the last two blocks, we can make that whole thing repeat. Can we? Yeah. 
Well, then, yeah, we could consult. Can we read that whole thing or repeat? Yeah. Just, like, one just like, move it to the side. Play like, complex. Yeah. This. And then put the repeat three times. And then put turn right, repeat three times. Yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna do the new one, yeah, because that was be since I turned the key. Well, then you put a repeat three times. Oh, I don't think we made him move forward. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. So after this, we need yeah, to move I think forward. so. Try it again. It's hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god wait yeah so he oh, so <laughs> I don't think so I think that's good no I think we have the outline um I'd call that a brick building <laughs> with like a little pool in the middle yeah it's like it's an indoor pool. I think it's impressive for my code. It definitely abilities. is a little more than 15 codes, but. So, as you can see, it's actually pretty challenging. There's a lot going on. They're talking to each other, they're referencing the environment, they're pointing, they're, they're having conversation, the environment is doing its thing, and there's knowledge involved. So, it's a, it's a complex piece to put together. So, our first attempt was let's see what we can do from speech. So, um, uh, and the, the one challenge you notice is, as you'll show you in a second, is that the speech is actually not very good quality in this initial data collection. And we wanted it to be semi-resemble, you know, reality. So here's a little, here's a little clip. You'll see the transcript at the time and then the actual speech. So looking at this, it looks like the easiest way to do it would probably be like down here, fill these in. Like have them go here, come down here, fill these in. So you can see this was this would be coded as like giving sharing two pieces of information. This is the construction of shared knowledge facet, but you can see the speech is actually pretty pretty awful. So the first data set we got was about 111 uh, utterances from about 20, 37 triads, and we looked at a couple of ways to model these human. The human code coded them all for these indicators based on um, every utterance, and then we just looked at some very simple models. Um, so the first approach is really just looking at you know, basically feature, linguistic features. So basically just using existing dictionaries like Luke. The second approach is using n-grams. Uh, this is just looking at words and phrases and then just training random forest models. And importantly, we wanna make sure that teams are independent. So these models generalize across teams. Uh, these do decent. And uh, then you can, you can contrast that with using any kind of transformer model. Like here is just BERT. Uh, and doing some fine tuning. Um, and this model actually works the best. Uh, and we're generally getting pretty good AURCs. Um, and this is on this data set. They actually are better than about 0.8. Um, and importantly, there's good discrimination of interfa interfacet discrimination. So the construction of shared knowledge model is not, is not very strongly correlated with the maintaining team function model and so on. And surprisingly robust to speech recognition errors. This data set was kind of noisy. The word error rates were about 45%. So you can think about this as like a 55% speech recognition accuracy, but these models are pretty robust. Um, and we've also, um, and Angela has done, we got a, a, work, a paper on the press right now, but we also looked at combining different modalities and seeing on the same data set, does that improve performance? So this is kind of what I just showed you. Um, this is using um, language. Uh, Sorry, could you mute, please? Um, um, so, so basically, um, here are a couple of models. So this is just using language and using language in the task information. And we wanted to see if adding different modalities could get you better performance here. Um, and this is uh, using two different types of models. And the reason, by the way, these aren't as good as the result I showed you earlier, because these don't have the transformers. These are just using n-grams. But you'll notice that the point is that um, in this case, you didn't get much of an improvement using all the modalities uh, compared to the verbal channel, which makes sense because the task is very heavily verbal. But critically, there's a lot of information in the nonverbals just by themselves. So even though they're not as good as the verbals, there's information in the nonverbals in this data set. So um, here's a little paper uh, that uh, another paper that is actually going to be presented at this conference uh, by uh, my student Sam, uh, where we essentially did the same thing, but here the data is actually occurring, coming from classrooms with dyads. 
So the dyads complete two tasks. One is this physics task I'll tell you about in a minute. And this is a math task. Um, and you can just see the difference uh, in the quality. So here are the kids uh, talking about this physics task. But I don't think that'll work. I think we need to do the uh, scale. The scale? Yeah. Like we've been doing. So, so that's a good quality speech, but it can be pretty noisy. Look at this mm. video. Oh. <laughs> submitting this math class collaboratively. Uh, so let's say they had like 300 students, right? Yeah, 300. It was 300 to 500. So, you can do um, so I would refer you to Sam's presentation for more details, but I think we got some interesting findings and he, he extended word in these interesting ways to uh, do that. Um, so, and lastly, we've been looking at generalizability. So this, uh, we have a two, we have this other data set. So I want to explain this a little bit more. This is a game called physics playground. And the goal is to basically get this red ball to this green balloon and everything follows the laws of physics. So you have to interact in this game and it's extremely engaging. Um, but it's very challenging. But you can imagine the, the kind of language you're using in this game is, is about physics and ramps and, and springboards versus this Minecraft thing where the language used here is about water and code blocks. And so it's a very different language. So the question is, can we train models that generalize? And it turns out that, so here's data from about 100 triads in the lab. Um, and these are groups of three. They both completed both tasks. And we collected them from three different universities. So it's very diverse. Uh, and they were coded using the same model of collaborative problem solving as showed you earlier. And what we actually find is that this is a metric called the transfer ratio. So one means basically a model trained on the same domain. How does it work on a, another domain? So one means it's perfect. And we actually noticed that out of the three models, uh, BERT generally transfers pretty well. And these are the three different facets. Um, so BERT that's trained on a large number of world knowledge that understands contextual semantics, the transformer model actually transfers pretty, pretty darn well. Um, and the uh, engram model, which is using specific words is the less, least likely to transfer, but still the transfers are, are pretty decent. So about a 0.5 means you're transferring about half. And the Luke model, which is about um, looking at um, basically just dictionary features is somewhat in the middle. So, so this is yet another advantage of the transformer models. They are both highly accurate and they're also better at generalizability. We're actually still analyzing this data right now. So lastly, when you have multiple people, you have this interesting challenge. How do you integrate data for multiple participants? So this is again, that physics playground data. Let me just show you a team just to give you a sense of what's occurring. So again, the goal is to get this green ball to this red balloon using laws of physics. And here they're, they're, they're drawing this like pendulum to like nudge the ball along. Ooh. Oh, maybe just more math <laughs> on the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> more what? Uh, just a bigger end. A bigger end. Okay. Yes, we have more math on the end. Scribble it. <laughs> yeah, so when I was doing this with the other one, I tried to scribble it. It would just delete. <sighs> Dang it. <laughs> it's, either, <laughs> it's either hit or miss on... Okay, well that didn't work. If you have to like get the right. You could maybe move it further down the tail. This doesn't work. Oh, that could work. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! yeah. <laughs> so as you can see, uh, this was much higher quality speech because it was collected with better equipment. Uh, and the challenge is, how do you go from this to the data I just showed you that was collected in classrooms with those middle school students, um, which was with the math and the problem solving task, which is very noisy, and that's a that's a key challenge. But the question now is, when you're combining data from multiple people, how do you consider that, right? So we looked at different ways in how to weight the contribute contributions of different people. One is based on the role. So in this, pro in this environment, one person is controlling the interaction, we call them the controller, and the other two are actually contributing to the solution, but they don't, they don't actually interact. The other one is trait-based. Maybe you weight the person that has different personality traits, maybe the one that shows leadership skills on some pre-surveys a little higher on personality. So that's the second way we looked into weighting. And the third is behavior-based weighting. Maybe the person that speaks the most should be weighted the most. Maybe they should be weighted the least. So we played around with different ways to weight these, um, these things. And in this case, we were trying to predict the outcomes. So in looking at, looking at uh, the interaction so far, does this group successfully solve the level or not? And this is um, this is like the this is like in this case this was a successful outcome. And here are some just very quick results. So first of all, 
we found that actually the different weightings had like no effect. Um, basically just doing equally weighting everybody was the best and we could never beat it based on the different weightings. So that was in this initial kind of investigation. Uh, and these are very simple random forest models, by the way. The second thing we found in this case, actually the models could be pretty accurate at predicting. So here's chance performance in terms of AURCs. And here's we con conducted some randomized baselines. The, and these are different combinations of modalities. So here's an example where actually including I, information from the eye gaze, the context, what's going on in the interaction and facial expressions um, was actually the most uh, accurate model. Um, so this is where multimodal combinations totally beat the best unimodal channel, which is uh, interesting in this case. So this is just getting us started in thinking about how to combine information for multiple people and multiple modalities. So let me turn around now from modeling to trying to improve collaboration. So this is a uh, work that um, Angela did uh, as part of a dissertation uh, and we're continuing to do now. Um, so here's what we said, okay, this is our first attempt. Let's see if we can improve collaboration by giving people feedback on the collabor collaborative problem solving outcomes. So uh, in this study, um, so just to recap everything, for each utterance, we actually take the data, we can run it through the model, the BERT model I just told you about, and it gives a prediction of uh, each facet. So in this case, it could be your likelihood that this was an evidence of construction of shared knowledge was 0.55. We average these, we compare these to some norm distributions and we get a score. So the way this works is teams interact, we grab their audio, we automatically extract them and run them through a speech recognizer, we run them through the models, we generate utterance level predictions. We actually then um, compare these to the norms and we get a feedback score. And the point is giving students feedback to reflect, will that help them improve in the next round? So that was the idea. When we were ready to do this, you know, the pandemic hit last year, so everything had to be done into Zoom. So this, you can imagine the challenges of being able to capture audio, run it through this whole pipeline in real time. Uh, it was pretty much a nightmare. Um, and then how do you give feedback? So what students tell you is that they want to see their own speech, but you can't really give them their own speech when you actually have speech recognition and a lot of errors. So to give them some personalization, we gave them these word clouds so they could just fee get a feel for what's going on. But the real feedback looked something like this. And this is after a lot of HCI. Um, so this is not something that just like just happened. Um, and uh, so one thing we did was uh, we gave them feedback on these three facets. We of course named them so they sound a little different. So this person will get a score, you're 22% on this facet, 93% on this, 69% on this, and these colors correspond to low, medium, and high. So this is low, this is medium, and this is high based on some norm distributions. They could also look at their feedback over multiple rounds. So they could see if they're improving or not. So this is kind of the feedback page. Then they could hit improve the score, and it actually gave them some concrete steps they could take. So for example, it would actually tell them what the indicators were. So to earn a high score in creating a positive team environment, you could ask others on your team for suggestions. You could give instructions and so on. You could compliment and encourage your teammates. And then we also gave them these little videos that actually demonstrated um, little tips on how you could see this. And these are from actually real examples. So this was kind of the feedback loop. And what we found was uh, interestingly mixed results. Um, so what we did was people played four rounds and we paired them. So they played in different roles. First, they were controlling the interaction, then they were observing it, then they were controlling it, then they were observing it. And because there's a lot of differences among the roles, we paired them up. So we would compare your score when you were the controller the first time to when you were the controller the second time, and then we would see if there was a change and so on and so forth. Um, so looking through the feedback, this was extremely open-ended. So they play a round and they get about five to seven minutes to mess around with the feedback. They play a second round and they go on like this. We essentially find that, you know, over time, they, of course, uh, they're spending about a minute on the score page and they still look at the score page across the rounds. Um, in terms of what they look at, they clearly are looking at the feedback, but it obviously diminishes over time. And they're spending a lot of time on the video examples, uh, interestingly. And uh, in terms of whether this improved their score, the data is a little complicated, but let me just tell you this uh, in, in the simplest way possible. So we looked at two things. One, if you already, the idea was if in this case, like for example, if you look at this case, I would imagine the person would focus on this score because they are the lowest. Here they got a 93%, they could probably ignore this. And here's a median score, right? So we, if, we look at, if we look at the scores across all three, you're gonna get nothing because people are, people are being strategic in how they engage with the feedback. 
And so what we found is that we divided the data into these two clusters, people who had at least one score. And then we find that those people actually improved that low score. And then we looked at people who had, who were already good. They were either average or they had a high score. And we found that there were no changes to the average, but there was actually, a dim, they diminished the high score because we think they were then focusing on the low score. So this data is a little messy and we're still unpacking it. Um, here's what they told us, generally some open-ended questions, open-ended feedback. There were some doubts about the accuracy. I was kind of surprised that the sharing ideas and expertise score was pretty low for the first two rounds. So even though the accuracy in this case was about 85% and we communicated that to them very explicitly and transparently, there were still some doubts. What they said though, is that they liked the examples a lot uh, and, but they did want, but they had following suggestions. They wanted personalizations of their own data. That's what everybody wants. They want the content of the feedback to change across the rounds. They felt it was too monotonous. They wanted feedback at the level of indicators, not at these facets. And they wanted feedback on negative behaviors. So since that, uh, you know, Sam, uh, who, who you'll hear from in this conference, has, we've looked at revising the feedback and I'll be very quick here, but essentially uh, what we've done is it's a lot more interactive and it's a lot more scaffolding. So. First, instead of giving them all three facets, we tell them, we're gonna focus on creating a positive team environment. This is the one they had the lowest score on. Then we actually tell them a little bit conceptual information. So it's, it's what is it about creating a positive environment? Then we actually give them the indicators. So that's the first piece. After that, uh, we actually give them um, a, um, we actually give them like a task. So in this task, uh, what we do is we, um, we uh, give them uh, an excerpt of a video and we have them spot out the indicator. So there's an interactive task and they get feedback. And then we actually give them a video and they're supposed to give coaching to the group in terms of open-ended feedback. So this is just to get it more engaging. Then we come again, the second round and we actually now give them a second task. So we say, okay, now let's, so then they take what they learned, they go play another round and they come back. And we may say, okay, here's your improved score. We give them a reminder of the facets again, how they did, and then we give them a second task. This is a little more complicated. There's three people engaging and they've got to compare two people based on the dialogue and behaviors and then this feedback. And then they do this again. So the idea is again, we're focusing on specific facets, we're giving them multiple rounds of feedback but they, and, and, and other changes. And we're actually collecting some data to see if this improves the collaborative outcomes. So uh, stay tuned for this. So lastly, I wanna point out that I won't say much about this, but in addition to improving collaboration by actually giving people and helping them become better collaborators, we've also been interested in how you can improve the interface. So these are some ideas from a couple of years back uh, with this idea of gaze sharing. So how do you share information from other people? So in this task, teams of up to five are engaged in this search task where they actually have to find a swimming pool in this image, and it's really difficult, as you can see. But each person's eye gaze is tracked, and then on the shared display, everybody sees everybody's eye gaze. So the idea is, can we give some feedback in the task environment to help people optimize their search? Uh, and here's an example. So you can see as the search is progressing, you can see how the space is being covered. And if I was a participant, I might wanna search this area where it's not actually being covered. So this was kind of interesting, but as you can notice, there's a lot of HCI involved, uh, human computer interaction involved because the gaze display itself can increase cognitive load and so on and so forth. So we're still resolving, trying to resolve these issues. So uh, let me just take a little step back now and talk to you a little bit about from modeling and supporting collaborative problem solving to understanding these interpersonal collaborations. And I wanna to talk to you about this idea of coordination, co-regulation and structural organization over time and space. And this will be rather brief, but just to pique your interest. Um, so when you take a step back and you think about what is happening in a collaboration that's different from what's happening in an interaction with an individual, you need a different lens. So when we think about cognitive systems, typically we think about input and output, right? And it's constrained in the head. This is traditional, for the most part, cognitive psychology. But when you think about people interacting with the world, like these examples I showed you, we need to think about it a little differently. And that's from the perspective of distributed cognition. So this is can be defined as a system of interacting individuals and the environment over time and space. 
And here in this diagram, you see different people interacting with media. And this was very popular in the 80s and 90s when people were trying to understand really complex systems. Like how do you navigate a, a, an airplane? You know, who, what is the system? It's the pilots, it's the instrument, it's the air traffic controller, it's the weather. And the idea is you understand this as a holistic system and not as these individual pieces. And then a second set of ideas that is very relevant and always resonated to me is this idea of when you're understanding complexity, you need a different language. And the language and the theoretical framing that helps complexity is complex systems. And in the case of interacting individuals, there's this idea of how people interact through what's called self-organizing into these functional interpersonal synergies. And just to give you an example of what this is, think about all these degrees of freedom when complexity increases, right? If I'm interacting with a team, I have all these different modalities in which I can communicate, I can say anything, I have so many degrees of freedom, the system is just unstable. What happens is the task puts constraints, and you form what's called these synergies and these synergistic patterns. And here's an example. These are my hands and all my muscle movements. I can form a synergy to actually do something. This is a clenched fist. This is a pointing gesture that it puts constraints on my other behaviors. And this is a really old idea for motor control back in the 70s. What people have done is taken this idea and applied it to understanding interpersonal coordination. And here's an example of two actors, um, and I forgot to put the citation here. This is work by Mike Riley. Um, this is two actors. And notice in this case, they're each forming lower degrees of freedom and producing a pattern, but they're not actually interacting. You can have coordination just because people are performing the same task. That's not a synergy, that's pseudo. A synergy is when they come together and interact jointly. And that's what we think about an interpersonal synergy. So what we're trying to understand is how do these synergies form and how does that help us understand theoretically what's happening when people are interacting? So uh, again, I'll, I'll spare you the details, but there's a, there's a couple of important factors to consider when you're looking at a systems-based approach. One, the most important thing is interaction dominant dynamics. You don't, you don't think about traditional computer models where I, where I do this processing and I pass data to this process. That's what we call component dominant dynamics. But here it's systems interacting at multiple levels and they have certain behaviors. And um, the key idea is that you have these stable points what we call basins of attraction and you have a system in these trajectories and they can go across space. And this is very complex stuff, but it's actually a really nice language to understand complex interactions. So um, the way we can recover these interactions is through an approach called recurrence quantification analysis. And it's actually pretty straightforward. So if you look at this system over time, and all you do is uh, you can mark these red dots are when the system is in, its same, it's in the same space. That's called an attractor. It's a, it's a state of the system that attracts certain behaviors. And you can use, you can actually construct, reconstruct to these plots, what's called a recurrence quantification plot, the behavior of these systems. And these patterns are patterns of stability. So this is a really interesting way to recapture complex dynamics. And of course, the details are not important. I just wanna point out three important take home messages. One, to understand complex systems, I'm advocating along with others, you need a complex system based approach. That's based on this idea of interaction dominant dynamics and this idea that a system is in constant movement and it's dynamic, but it has these stable states. There are actually methodologies and frameworks to recover and understand the system dynamics of which one is called RQA, which is what we're gonna analyze here. So um, when we think about these patterns, there are some interesting things that come up. So one is, and how we're trying to push the envelope a little bit, you can think about what's called a person exhibiting behavior. So these A, B, C, D, these are behaviors. So me exhibiting the same behavior, we just call that self-similarity. So later on in time, I exhibited A again and I exhibited C again. When two people are interacting, you can have coordination. They are exhibiting the same behavior. They are coordinating. And they could be at the same amount of time or it could be delayed right there. But the interesting thing is when you have teams together, it is more than just coordination. It's this idea of regularity. So look at this. These are three people. And notice they're exhibiting extremely different behaviors, but the same pattern. So at the same time, they're out of sync. But three cycles later, they follow the same pattern. So this is one another way to look at teamwork beyond coordination. And the question is, 
What is a better approach to understand collaborative problem solving? Is it these well-rehearsed coordination patterns or is it actually these more different patterns of irregularity? So in our first analysis, this is going back to that mind graph data I shared with you earlier. We actually looked at eight channels together. So these are speech from three people, body movements from three people and movements occurring in the actual environment. And we looked at these eight signals jointly using this RQA framework. It's a really powerful framework to try to understand these complex patterns and dynamics within small windows of time. And we actually found this pretty interesting finding that it was irregularity that actually predicted better facets of collaborative problem solving after accounting for basic behaviors. And the idea is that the teams that are able to form be more flexible. Remember, these are creative, challenging problems. These are not routine problems that could organize themselves to very rapidly adapt were better at solving these problems. That's a preliminary finding. We replicated that in another data set. This is the physics data set. In this case, looking at different channels. Here we looked at body movements, speech, and GSR, uh, electrodermal activity. We actually analyzed it in a different way where we combine them at the team level. So we actually averaged the three team members, built the plots, and we also found that this irregularity, again, predicted the better task score. So that was a kind of pretty interesting finding that we're actually looking into exploring further. Uh, we've also looked at things a little more traditionally. So this is again, back again to the same uh, thing. This is looking at uh, the Minecraft data I showed you. You can break it up into three pieces, right? Is a, are, we, are we executing the solution? Are we constructing the solution? And are we like interacting with the partner? And what we did was we looked at these three unimodal primitives, like, a, like what are you doing? Are you idling? Are you not doing nothing? Are you constructing? Are you executing speech and body? And how we put them together into these different bimodal and multimodal patterns. And here's what we found. This is a lot. Uh, essentially, if you look at a single unimodal primitive, you find that not doing anything was negatively correlated with the task score. And executing was actually trying things out was actually positively correlated with the task score but constructing the code had no relation. But interestingly, you can qualify that. So idling when you are silent was really bad. So this is a team that is in some weird dynamics and idling silence and not moving was like much more negatively correlated. In addition, you can find that so, but other combinations of idling when something is going on are actually uncorrelated. So, so being tr this is an example of how these multimodal and bimodal systems can come together to help us get a deeper understanding of what's going on. And uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'll just skip on, but I wanna also say that we've also done a lot of work with gaze and how we can deconstruct these. Uh, so this is eye gaze of different people and the environment and how we can deconstruct different types of patterns. So it's not just saying there's a pattern or not. In this case, you can actually see different colors here representing different patterns to help us understand what's really going on with these really complicated interactions of an individual and the environment. Now, the important piece I wanna point out though is that it's critical, at least we think, to jointly model the whole thing in one system. And this is one mechanism to do that. Uh, I'll skip this in the interest of time, but we've uh, done other types of modeling uh, of these data. And lastly, um, I wanna say that uh, over the last five years, we've been taking this work we've been doing outside of education and more into the workforce, because remember, we want education to translate into the workforce. This was a large project where we did multimodal modeling of individuals, about 800 information workers all over the US. We tracked them and we monitor them over one year. Uh, and one of the findings we had is, and this was looking beyond educational outcomes into health outcomes uh, and into workplace outcomes. And here's a really fun finding where we looked at heart rate, sleep, and using wearable sensors and daily activity. And we looked at an individual over time and we have this idea of health regularity, the extent to which uh, people are following these routine behaviors and how those correspond to different um, health, and, health and workplace outcomes. And currently, where in another study, uh, we'll be looking at teams uh, in the workplace. So teams of three to five. Uh, and here's a, here's a paper we're revising right now where we're looking at alignment of sleep patterns. So COVID has really introduced really great, interesting disruptions in how teams collaborate. Here's a team that is very much aligned in their sleep pattern. And this is a team that's very much misaligned. Which one do you think is actually um, better, at, better at being, you know, is, more, is a better team in terms of functioning and outcomes? 
um, you know, you'll have to read the paper because we're still analyzing the data, but, uh, but it's very interesting to think about these different things. And sleep is really, really fun and critical. A uh, little plug here, uh, as you can imagine, it's very hard to collect data from authentic teams in the middle of a pandemic. So we're still recruiting here as a website. Um, this is a great study. If you're interested, please, um, please just, just Google Future of Work UCI and always send me an email and we'd love to um, have you participate in the study. Okay, so let me just end the last nine minutes um, by talking a little bit about uh, looking, um, looking forward uh, and, and talking a little bit about the National Institute of Student AI teaming that I think brings all these um, ideas together. So we're one of seven inaugural NSF AI institutes. I think there's another set, set up to come up very quickly. And this is the NSF's big investment uh, in uh, AI. And one of the institutes was AI in education. Um, so uh, back to what I spoke about earlier as in terms of opportunities for innovation, uh, one was in, 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 our, in my view, uh, in our view, one was enhancing the bandwidth of communication. The second one was developing the whole student. And the third one was reimagining ethical and equitable AI. And um, here's kind of how we're looking at this, keeping this in mind. I wanna just tell you a little bit about the vision of our Institute. So we're founded around this question of how to promote deep conceptual learning through rich socio-collaborative learning experiences for all students, right? So we've known for decades that collaboration is one of the most effective ways students learn, not the only, but one of the most effective ways to get at deep learning, but it's really challenging and people know this, but it's very challenging to implement collaboration in a classroom for the simple reason the teacher is not omnipresent. So if you think about what happens, you have a classroom of about 28 people roughly, you can have teams of three and four. So you have about seven, you have about seven to eight teams and you have a teacher who has to coordinate among seven or eight teams at the same time. This is not only causes a lost opportunity, a, a challenge because when students get stuck, they can go off topic and go off task, but it also is a lost opportunity. So many times these teams could be having really amazing collaborations and conversations but this is actually lost on the radar of the teacher because they're not around, because they're not omnipresent. So I have first-hand experience with this. I taught a course of AI, introduction, introductory to AI with 106 juniors two years ago. And in every class, we had one 20 minute collaborative activity. And it was exhausting having to just run around to handle these different teams. At the same time, it was immensely rewarding. This dead pin silence of a lecture suddenly the whole classroom became alive as people were actually in, interested and engaging, right? And it's exhausting and it's a testament to these teachers who do this five times a day, five days a week, uh, and I was doing it twice a week. So in thinking about how can, what is the, how can we reimagine what, what AI can do in education? One future we thought about is this AI being a social collaborative partner that helps students and teachers work and learn more effectively, engagedly, and equitably. And this is connected to opportunity one, which is enhancing the bandwidth of communication of AI. So in our vision, you can imagine that these small groups of students are working on well-designed curriculum, but the AI partner is helping them, helping them facilitate these conversations. So you can imagine in this case, it could just be a collaborative coach. It could just be a Q and A system. It could even be part of the interaction in, in this form. Uh, and it could be many things. Um, in this case, it could be uh, a disembodied voice, it could be an animated agent, it could even be an embodied agent. But importantly, it's helping the students keep these collaborative discussions on track. And I, I wanna say discussions because we're emphasizing discourse. Um, at the same time, it's constantly communicating with the teacher. The teacher is an instrumental part of this interaction. So it's the teams, the students, the teacher and the AI, it's helping, the, helping them orchestrate more effective and engaging collaborative experiences. And it's not only that, because this is not, uh, this is, this, the, because the AI is not constrained over space over time, it can actually understand an individual student, understand how the student behaves in different groups and use that to provide recommendations to the teacher as to how to structure the conversation. At the same time, it can give teachers guidance on what's going on in the student groups. Sometimes students are saying amazing things, what's exciting them. So you can really imagine by having some sight and sense in each group, how this, the AI partner can help make the invisible to the teacher 
visible. And importantly, the teacher controls everything. It's always the teacher who's in charge because we believe that in the human in the loop, the teacher knows best and the teacher is an instrumental part of how to orchestrate these interactions. That's a high level vision. In terms of the second opportunity of developing the whole students, our idea is to integrate this idea of AI education in existing science and tech courses to provide measurable learning outcomes. So um, we're looking in, we're actually develop, working on AI literacy. So in addition to developing domain knowledge and 21st century skills, we're making all these all activities, focusing very much on collaborative problem solving and critical thinking. We're also looking at inquiry learning and academically productive talk. So getting students to speak in certain ways and engage in certain kinds of activities. And at the same time, help students uh, understand the importance of AI and ethics in society and the nature of behavior, power and consequences of AI systems. Um, and empowering students to be contribute to an AI-based workforce. Um, so there's, there's a blend here of foundational literacies, of 21st century collaborative skills, of understanding ethics in society, and helping students uh, really develop um, some of the character traits and intrapersonal skills. And lastly, um, we've, uh, our, our institute, ISAT, has adopted a framework of responsible innovation. So we're thinking about reimagining uh, ethical and equitable AI, and this means that this is the framework that, you, that, that guides everything we do, uh, is, is, our, is our visionary framework. And the idea is to think about the, when you're thinking about AI and developing AI in education, is really thinking about what, what is the model on how you develop these technologies. This framework emerged in, as guidance on how to develop very ethically challenging technologies. In the case of our work, there are issues of surveillance. How do students perceive being having an AI partner surveilling them, specifically historically marginalized students. There are questions of uh, data privacy security. There's questions of ethics. There's a lot of deep questions that come into play when you're, when you're embedding AI in actual classrooms. And so we're looking very differently at this problem by engaging students, parents, community leaders, teachers, and other stakeholders in really thinking about the design of these AI. So I just give you some hypothetical designs of the AI partners, but we don't really know what the right role should be, what will be tolerated, and because we have yet to engage, and we're gonna engage in these, uh, in the next actually month, multiple workshops with students and teachers and the community leaders to figure this out. So this is just a quick look at how we're thinking about our institute. Um, and just to, um, just to um, go a little quicker, uh, we, um, have developed, organized the institute into these different research strands. One is focusing on foundational AI, what we call strand one, basically understanding and facilitating collaborations. Um, we have strand three, which is looking at broadening participation with co-design and ethical design of AI. And then connecting them to is uh, strand two, which is focusing on inter orchestrating interactions with AI. So here we have people in computer supported collaborative learning uh, and, and so on. So. Uh, so the idea is to blend what's called foundational work in doing things like speech recognition and gesture recognition with use inspired research, which helping achieve learning outcomes um, in a way that uh, broadens participation in AI workforce development and community engagement. So uh, at the interest of time, I'll just say that uh, in, in my last minute, um, we have a diverse set of folks uh, in the, it was really fun and challenging to get an institute going in the middle of a pandemic because we started last September. But I'm really happy to say we've onboarded about 45 researchers and partners. Uh, and we've also got uh, about 28 students and postdocs um, involved, uh, here they are. Uh, and we're really excited uh, in, our, uh, in our vision and our mission. Um, so uh, let me just end by, uh, by pointing you to our website where you can learn more information about um, about our work, that's the website right there. Uh, and here's my website where you can get copies of papers um, and other things. So um, thank you so much uh, for your attention. Um, Sharon, do you want me to handle the questions? Oh yes, go ahead. Okay. Cool, cool. Uh, thank you, Sydney. Very great talk. Uh, learned a lot. Um, so we have already some questions on the speak up and I'm gonna ask in order of uh, voting. So uh, the attendees, you can vote on the questions that you'd like to hear first. 
So the first question is about measuring the collaboration outcome. Um, does the person who posted the question want to ask in person? I give you like a few seconds. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so the question is that you're mentioning, especially in the Minecraft um, challenge or, or project, uh, when you're mentioning um, comparing the result of um, collaboration and outcome, how are you comparing them? Are you comparing the, the time spent on achieving the goal or are you, are you, uh, are you trying to uh, measure the, the steps? Uh, the lines of code or whether the task is completed. So what, what are you measuring? Um, let me give you the short answer and a little bit of a longer answer. In our specific case, um, they're given a, a challenge. It was intendedly done. So it was almost impossible for anybody to solve the problem. One team, I think, solved it, but they could have graded solutions. They're given four constraints and then the, the outcomes are scored. You get a point uh, on something. There's a coding rubric based on how well they solve the problem. So this, so, so that's the short answer. It's basically the quality of the solution. However, um, that's just one outcome. Uh, in in collaboration and in negotiation, it's it's widely known that actually a lot of people value these subjective outcomes equally, if not more. So another outcome is how was the teamwork and the collaboration. So uh, one of the big findings in in the negotiation world is that many times. Um, uh, individuals are actually happier with an outcome where uh, both people get a little less, um, but they're more equitable um, and they actually have a successful negotiation rather than the winner take all. So this case, we just looked at a very physical, a, a very tangible outcome, but we're also looking at uh, these more, they also self-report the quality of the collaboration. And that's a second set of outcomes uh, we've been, we, we are looking at, but, but not have, but have not yet. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, so the next question is about summarizing the social cognitive features. Um, I think uh, Yun Kai, do you Kai, do you want to ask it in person? Oh, you. Yeah, me again. Both. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, let me see where the second question is. Um, so the second question is. Um, when you're, uh, you know, one of the slides, one of the earlier slides, when you're listing a, a list of uh, cognitive features that, uh, that you know, contribute to uh, uh, teamwork as well as uh, students' performance uh, during uh, collaborations, are they, how are they summarized? Are they summarized from uh, psychology studies? Are they summarized from uh, empirical experiments? Or uh, the, the main question is really, are they, uh, more like a quantitative summarization, or is it qualitative so that you can actually measure them in some way? Yeah, very good, thank you. There, the, the features basically fall into three categories. Uh, one are individual features. Uh, here's an example of an individual, let's just take eye gaze, right? Um, an individual feature of eye gaze uh, would be your um, number of eye gaze fixations over a point in time, your fixation durations. And these all have, and we've been very selective with features here and very few and very limited number of features um, because we're also interested in understanding what's actually happening behind the scenes and not just optimizing the performance. That's a different thing. Um, but uh, so for I, I might look at your um, your number of fixations, your fixation duration. Um, another great feature, by the way, is fixation dispersion, how your gaze is dispersed across the screen. That's you. Then we actually look at another set of features that are you and me, uh, individual. Uh, and those in eye gaze fall into four categories, joint attention. Uh, if, I, if, if, there's a ref, if there's an object here, are we looking at the same thing in the, in the middle of time? Gaze aversion, I'm looking at you, you're looking elsewhere. Mutual gaze, we're both looking at the same time uh, and so on. So, so there's individual social features uh, and, then, and then that's how we're kind of constructing these features. Thank you. So the next question is um, measuring which kind of feedback helps the students more. So I'm going to read that. There are multiple kinds of feedback and notes to the students to help them collaborate better. How would you measure which ones were the most effective and help the most? Yeah, that's a really great question. And we really don't have the answers here. We're, look, we're like slogging through and struggling through. I'll tell you a few things we tried. And, and I really would encourage you to email Angela Stewart, uh, who really did all this work. Um, 
But here's a few things we tried that just didn't work. Uh, at first, we had this great idea, right? Real-time dynamic intervention. Okay, well, the problem is that when students are interacting in this task, it turns out that actually they totally miss the, they miss the intervention. So they totally ignore it or they just nod at it and it's not enough time to process it and do something. You can imagine that in certain situations where you know, you're really not letting one person talk and two people are dominating the conversation. That could be, an, that could be a little nudge, but in, but, but that, in, our, in our initial studies, that didn't work. The second question is, do you, give in, in, do you give feedback to the individual or the team? We haven't really resolved that. We just focused on the individual. And so we really went through many iterations. In terms of how we look at improvements, um, to your question, in this case, uh, we, we're looking to see, did they improve the focal collaborative behavior? So if my score on, collabor on, on sharing information was you know, at a 62% and I give feedback, how do I increase on that pass it? Do I go from 62% to 75% relative to the other ones in which I didn't get feedback? So right now, we're not doing experimental work because we're still just trying to get something going. Once we have evidence that people can improve relative to themselves, then we would want to actually include, include control groups um, that, for example, get feedback on, on other, other aspects, such as um, how much are they speaking, how they're doing turn-taking. So we want to compare feedback focused on these collaborative facets and these complicated models to just something simple uh, focused on basic interaction dynamics. So we're, we're not there yet, uh, but we hope to be there. Yeah. Great, thank you. And Ken, next question is yours. Would you like to ask it yourself? Um, I guess I asked more than one question in there. So, uh, <laughs> but don't the one I wrote most recently, and I, I, I will speak out loud. Uh, Sydney, I, you, earlier you said complex phenomena require complex models, and and I think that's a, a compelling uh, statement and worth worth pursuing. I think you can also look at situations where science has really advanced from simple models of complex phenomena. So, what what's your sense of what should EDM be doing? You know, we're seeing a lot of complex models of complex phenomena with deep learning networks, for example, but then there's also progress with more, you know, like just let's just use regression with, with well-engineered features kind of thing. What's your sense? Oh, uh, yeah. Between those alternatives. Well, thank you for that question. So a great question. So I, 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 two things that I want to, I want to just clarify uh, and also respond. So, I want to clarify that I'm not talking about complex models in terms of like the, the terms, the terms are not great. Complex models doesn't mean a complicated model. It just means a complex systems approach, which could actually be a very simple model. In fact, some of the, some of the most, the, some of the most complex systems models are actually very simple at the core. So it's complex systems approaches. That doesn't mean the model is complex. Yes, it's alpha, it's, it's word soup. To your point, Ken, uh, this is a very, very, you know, very pertinent question, um, and uh, I don't have an answer. Um, I'll give you one concrete example. I didn't speak about this today. Uh, we've been looking at models of eye gaze uh, in, in other work, predicting reading comprehension, a very, very simple uh, task. And we, we, we keep finding that a, a regression model with seven features um, is it, with a very carefully set of seven features that we can interpret, we can understand, is giving us really good results compared to a very complex model with you know, millions of features in that one domain. So what I have seen in reviewing a lot of papers is that it's, a, it's kind of just assumed that um, you always just need to abandon everything in the past and you just need to go with the most complex model and you, you get the best performance. And, I, and, and there are cases where that is correct. Um, in the case of the collaborative problem solving, uh, in some of those models, the, the, the results with BERT, and, and BERT is not even, that's like three years old now, have just been incredible compared to the traditional approaches. So, but in every case, at least for my own satisfaction, and I encourage everybody is try out the simplest theoretical model and have a contrast. If you're looking at investigating any model that has a temporal component, try it out without a temporal component. If you're looking at a multimodal model, try it out with a, with a unimodal comparison. And you'll be shocked, uh, I think, as to how many times, how far you can go with a simple interpretable model. Um, and then the second thing I just want to point out is, um, is looking at the models and how they generalize. Uh, now, one thing I'll say is that the more you can incorporate world knowledge, though, 
pre-trained models, um, pre-trained transformers, and pre-trained features. Uh, in many cases, that, just being able to extract features uh, from using these large pre-trained models are really showing a lot of promise. But very rarely, I feel like we have data in which we can train end-to-end -end models. Um, and so in, in, in that case, we just do a lot better. I've seen, at least my own work, uh, working with, you know, just comparing very complex models with much more simpler uh, interpretable ones. Thank you. So there is a question about um, non-game environments. Um, Want to ask in person? Emma. Oh, uh, yes. So um, the question is, with a lot of these collaboration studies, they're focusing typically on some STEM-oriented task or something of that nature. Uh, are there studies that are moving into other environments? So something like cooking, which can be a collaborative task, uh, are there studies looking at those types of worlds? Yeah, so uh, there are actually. Um, and uh, I, I, think the, uh, I, I, I think the community that's looking at that a lot is the ICMI, the multimodal interaction community, and, and, and Kai has, has a few things there. I want to, one, one thing I want to point out, just, just is, it's a really great question. Um, so, you know, in that one study we did in the, in the schools, we very intentionally compared the collaborative problem solving game with the math task. Uh, and that project was focused on assessing collaboration. And um, what we find is that when you have a task that has a lot of domain knowledge, prior knowledge like math, algebra, um, the prior knowledge just takes up so much of variance that there's very little left over to be explained by anything else. And if the goal is to assess, again, I'm saying for assessment, you really wanna unpack the, collab, the, the knowledge piece um, from the collaboration piece. Of course, in reality, they're baked in the cake. Um, and and I, I'm not aware of a lot of work that has looked at different domains, um, but I just want to point out that I've seen, I've seen papers in ICMI on the virtual bartenders and cooking, and, and the robotics community has looked at that a lot. And then you have the, uh, the defense community and the military community where they've looked at a lot of different tasks ranging from uh, collaboration in, in perceptual motor tasks um, and all sorts of things. So so it is, it is quite out there. We've just been focusing on games. And the reason is uh, when you're doing collaboration, it's really good to have people have something that they're enjoying and they talk. And I've never been in a study where after the study is over, the students want to stay in the lab and play the game for free because they love it so much. Thank you. Peter's question just got bumped up. So Peter. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, uh, CJ, really great talk. Amazing collection of good ideas and explorations in how we can study and uh, improve support, collaborative problem solving support. But I, I, I see some pockets of expertise in other fields. Specifically, I was looking at collaborative uh, information retrieval, and it looks like a bunch of very similar ideas explored there. There could be other pockets of similar things, and none of us, of course, know all of them. But have you look at some uh, similar domains where there is a different task but still people need to do it together. And they also created a bunch of good ideas how to do. Uh, if you look at them, what are the other domains we need to look at ourselves for a source of ideas? Yeah, Peter, that's a great question. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, as always, we always risk, as you just said, <laughs> running in these silos. I, I, I've not looked extensively. We've looked a lot at, as, as a, the, the, you know, there's 50 years of team science and just being able to, go through that is, um, is, is a lot. We've looked at com the computer supported collaborative work literature of a bunch. Then there's the computer supported collaborative learning stuff. I think what we've not looked at and we probably should is uh, because you, you know, thank you for your suggestion is more into the, the work on collaborative recommend recommender systems and, and crowdsourcing world a little more. I know there's a lot of really interesting work going on there. Um, so uh, I've looked some, but uh, thank you for that suggestion. It, it's definitely an area where we need to look at more. And then there's, there's of course the small group problem solving, which is a very much of a cognitive thing and there's a whole literature there. So, but, but, but thank you. Um, I look forward to uh, seeing what's going on in uh, Rexis and um, oh. you know, UMAP. Thank you for the hint, thanks. Yep. Yeah. So there is another question on regularity. If mm -hmm. the person wanna ask um, in person. 
I can also read it. So uh, it says on regularity, is it correct that it was better if groups tended to not repeat a certain combination of behaviors? Is that what irregularity means? And I guess there was another question on regularity also that could it be task dependent, meaning that some of the tasks are more uh, need of regularity, like a divide and conquer, while the other kinds need less? Yes, very much so. So it's a great question. And it's an only, we always like to distinguish between what's, that's a very good question. Uh, what's the difference between task work and teamwork? And the, the, if you think about task work is how you, how you divide up a complex task into small components and people can just go and do the work, right? So, uh, you know, if, if you think about a, a production line in a restaurant, um, somebody is the fry cook and somebody is actually the, what they call the middle, middle person and somebody's at the salad and somebody's putting the food together. They're all doing different things and they're all, they're all coordinating in a certain way, right? So we look at that as that's a, that's a kind of task, but that's a very routine task. You are looking at tasks where there is no solution. And our findings are extremely preliminary and they're hinting towards this idea of irregularity. Um, so, so it is correct, the irregularity year is, and by the way, irregularity doesn't mean zero. It means that um, there is some structure, clearly, but, uh, and, and we do find structure because it's different from chance behaviors, but it's not these very routine things. Uh, if the task is marching, you'd want extreme coordination and you know, extreme, um, yeah, synchrony, yeah. Thank you. So next I'm going to ask my own question because it got bumped up. Uh, so my question is AIs can lack a little bit in creativity and would the help of AI systems in collaborating result in having one singular best way to collaborate that in AI imposes rather than other kinds of collaborative ways that could work or emerge naturally? And would it affect the students' and uh, teachers' evaluation and standards for what is the best way to collaborate? And I give an example, like autocomplete in our emails may change the way that we write. So would this happen here? It's a really, really good question. And um, so, you know, at the, at the heart of this question is, what is the way to understand collaboration? Um, and, you know, we've been taking um, a very much uh, top-down approach, uh, a very much theoretically driven approach, frameworks and all this stuff. And I'm actually, that's taken us far, but there are limits to that actually, uh, because that just, con that just colors how we look at the whole thing. And the more we're looking at this data and we are having patterns we can't understand, we're actually finding that um, that is uh, that is good and has some limits. So we're now trying to look at look actually relook at. And when you, by the way, when you're analyzing collaborative data and discourse, you wind up coding the data like eight times. So we're on the third or fourth one now. Um, so we're looking at it differently, and we're actually looking at a lot of now that we've got the high level codes, looking at a lot of actually applying a lot of techniques from this community uh, on how to look at patterns, uh, combinations of patterns but still we're stuck with what we've coded. So what we might have to do again, to your point, is actually go and look at the videos again for the fourth time and try to figure out what is occurring and, and how things are happening. So it's, I don't have an answer uh, except to say a very unsatisfying answer, but it's probably true. It's about being able to understand some kind of blending thing, you know? Thank you. Ken has a follow-up, I guess. Yeah, would you like to? Yeah, like I guess another way to say this is how many KCs in collaboration? <laughs> is it you know, is it a lifetime of learning, a course worth of learning, a, a you know, a, a few sessions? I, I think it's a I think it's an absolutely absolutely uh, fascinating question. Um, so one thing that in our in our studies thus far, it's it's one shot, right? They're there for like five rounds, but. In the AI Institute, actually, uh, the curriculum units that the students will engage in sometimes last from uh, you know two to four weeks, and that will give us an opportunity to figure out. Of course, not with not as much experimental control as we like, but at least to figure out, you know, because what are the how do we how much time does it take? How does it support things? I I think about this personally as um, if if. if I, I, I think it could be one of these things where you need to, you know, there's certain things that certain high level ideas can really help ground your work. And once you have those high level ideas, 
then you get into this idea of putting it into practice. And it's so funny you say this because yesterday um, I was driving back from New Mexico and we we're listening to some podcasts and they were actually talking about what is the thing that kills teams. And there's three things that kills teams. A person who's very, very pessimistic, a social loafer, um, and a person who's kind of a jerk. And so I think if you can ask yourself, first of all, let me make sure I check these three boxes and be consciously aware of my behavior, that's a start. Then you can get into financing, right? So it's this, it's this combination of, um, of things. Uh, we, we don't know. Uh, we, well, all we know is that it's way harder than we thought, and we've not been doing very well so far in our, in our approaches to improve it. Right. I have one last question on speak up, and I think that would give us the latest, uh, actually, we have to wrap up after that. So the question is the idea that complex phenomena require complex models is a compelling Oh, that's one. the and one so, I, I did ask earlier. Sherry. Oh, okay. I, I, oh, I okay, okay. Question. But my other question oh. was about whether you have individuals, uh, data with individuals in multiple teams such that you might be able to infer individual uh, collaborative skill from the team's you know, results that they are on? Uh, uh, yeah, it's a great question. We don't yet, what, we've been, what, we, what we're starting to do is individual data in multiple tasks. And we're trying to see you know, the classic, do you need, um, you know, is this, the CFA have two latent factors, one latent factor, that kind of stuff. But it's basically, we have that data and we're actually looking at that data but we don't have individual multiple teams. We're hoping to get that actually. Great, uh, so I think we have to wrap up. Sharon, do you wanna? Yes, well, uh, thank you so much, Sydney, uh, for a very insightful, really wonderful talk. And, you know, we really have a lot to learn too. Uh, all right, thank, thank you all very much for participating uh, to this keynote. Thank you again, Sydney. And you're welcome Thanks, to stick it's around great, great with questions. all other sections. Thanks, and I hope to see you all in person next year. Yay. Sooner.